Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us uh, here at Heavybit. Um, if you're not familiar with the space, Heavybit is a, uh, an accelerator and investor specifically focused on developer tooling. Um, I'm, my name is Konstantin. I'd be the sort of participant MC um, here tonight. Um, I'm the CEO of BlockDaemon. We're uh, a heavy bit company. Uh, you can see our logo on the screens. They show like different bits and pieces. You'll see uh, us on there. Um, the format today here is uh, we wanted to talk about a couple of big buzzwords that uh, tend to mean everything and nothing, which is interoperability and decentralization. And uh, really what that means is we want to go and have an, uh, an insightful and entertaining conversation around how we can build and evolve blockchains uh, towards actual things developers and, hand up and users can ultimately utilize. And so um, there is a couple of different companies um, and ideas represented here. Um, we have people who think in bigger pictures around data, uh, people who are very focused on the enterprise. Um, and uh, so I'm going to give a quick introduction. I'm, I'm going to introduce you guys because I, I wanted to say what I think of you guys. And then you can <laughs> introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> and you, you, know, you can tell people what you do. Um, I'm going to start with myself because I'm rude, um, and the because uh, I'm going to forget. And so, um, Block Demon, we're we're an orchestration tool. We're a multi-cloud platform uh, deploying multiple protocols, uh, you know, across multiple clouds. Uh, one of the key things, and and uh, a full disclosure, um, I have two investors on the panel, a partner, and I'm a member of Hyperledger. So um, I have relations with all these people. The starting point for us was. We really were focused on providing decentralization services. And so really um, getting uh, protocols and users to understand that it's not very smart to run a bunch of nodes on Amazon East, for example. So some, some of the protocols, I'm not naming names, but when we actually reached out to some of them, uh, we found out that uh, you know, there isn't really orchestration between the nodes. People deploy nodes wherever they are, do bit particular bits and pieces, but there's no way to actually manage the integrity of a network. And when we started Block Demon a year ago, um, that wasn't as popular a subject as it is actually now. So we've been um, uh, growing ever since. We're the only deployment solution for Stella, for you know, multiple different protocols. And uh, right now we're focusing on uh, relaunching a little decentralization. How do we, what are we going to call uh, The Block Demon Decentralization Score trademark. That's right. B trademark. Uh, BDS. That's right. Uh, we're, we actually have an <laughs> algorithm run uh, which calculates the, uh, you know, it's kind of sort of a little bit of a secret sauce of, uh, you know, how many nodes are live and then on how many different continents and how many different cloud providers are they run. And, uh, and so we're, we're, we're trying to sort of, you know, and obviously this is an abstract metric that you can debate, um, but it's a starting point. And so, um, and it's data driven. And it's data driven. Mm -hmm. um, we have customers, um, and uh, you know we're we're yeah some of some of them are here, and so um, that's me. Now to my left is Meltem. <coughs> Meltem um, is um, <coughs> personally uh, you know one of the smartest people in the space. Um, she's somebody who uh, thinks specifically a lot around uh, the investment side, tokenization. She ran the DCG investment portfolio companies, sort of kind of looking after those guys, which, you know, if you know DCG, that's kind of pretty much every blockchain company in the space, except for Blockdaemon. Um, and, uh, but we rectified that because then I invested that's in That's right, and then Meltem <laughs> invested in it. Um, and so um, she's, a, a, you know, somebody who's uh, really on top of kind of what's happening, very, very um, looped into the, the uh, uh, blockchain world and somebody who um, we wanted on, uh, as an investor because she gave us crypto credibility, you know? Mm. And so... Um, and yeah. trademarkable metrics. And, tra <laughs> and, and trademarkable <laughs> metrics. Next door is Matt. Matt is the CEO and founder of Aeon. Um, I actually, two things with Matt, and so we're, we're deploying their nodes. Uh, Aeon is um, the only other protocol or project that I met that really thinks about how to tackle the infrastructure problem um, that exists in the blockchain world. And uh, Matt has, uh, we were actually having a similar, we were on a panel, I think, at a conference, um, and we were, I was listening to you and I was kind of thinking, you're actually one of the best speakers that talks about blockchains in an understandable way that I've actually heard in a, in a long time. So, um, you know, it's great to have you on. Aeon is a, a really interesting project. You guys did a token sale. Um, and so there's a couple of things uh, very focused on interoperability. So we're going to talk about that. Um, next to Matt is Daniela. Uh, she works with a very uh, good friend of ours, uh, Brian. Um, she uh, works with Hyperledger. Uh, Hyperledger, obviously associated with IBM uh, and the Fabric protocol. And uh, what's interesting around Hyperledger, there's actually two things that I find very interesting. One is the, the uh, consensus structure of the consortium itself. So uh, it's actually something we've copied for other consortia that we've developed because 
you know, it's very complicated to get a lot of people to agree on taxonomy and code and all that type of stuff. So Hyperledger Brian uh, was one of the founders of the Apache and, uh, you know, is a great open source uh, sort of thinker and Daniela sort of joined him and I remember talking to Brian, he's kind of also trying to decentralize himself, so Daniela is sort of kind of stepping into <laughs> his shoes. So I'm a node, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brian took it to the next meta level. He's now fully decentralized. <laughs> and so... Um, Through block game, and I hope, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're deploying fabric nodes, that's true. <laughs> and so, and then uh, last but not least, um, Sam. Sam um, uh, was introduced to me uh, via one of our investors. And uh, Sam has a very, uh, you know, he's very sharp. And what I find very interesting is that he thinks... Um, actually about fairly large subjects around data, privacy, uh, you know, journalism, like he's involved in a lot of different bits and pieces. He's been uh, uh, involved in Facebook. Um, and so I think there's uh, something really interesting there um, when we think about what really blockchains mean in terms of you know, privacy and, and also really data sharing in general. He also is the author of B is for Bitcoin, um, the first children book. I am the best-selling children's book author in the crypto space. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Which is actually as big a statement as when I say Blockdemon is the largest SaaS company in the crypto space. We're just like, yeah. We we're are like all winners. <laughs> yeah, we're all winners. All winners. <laughs> so anyway, but now I want to, um, you guys introduce yourself, t tell us uh, a little bit, what was your, um, you know, your sort of blockchain moment that kind of got you excited about it? And then, uh, you know, we'll uh, try to have a, a gentle conversation. Cool. And I'm going to ask probing questions. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so thanks to Constantin for the great introduction. Very flattering introductions. Do you want to follow me around and do that? <laughs> yeah, <no laughs> daily yeah. It's like a pump up. Yeah. Um, so as uh, Constantin mentioned, I spent my first three years professionally in crypto uh, building an investment firm called Digital Currency Group. Um, when I left in January of this year, we had invested in over 120 companies across 30 different countries, um, worked on building businesses under that umbrella as well, an OTC desk, an asset management business, and a media company, as well as an enterprise advisory business. So um, got an opportunity to work with a lot of amazing founders, entrepreneurs, investors, asset managers, governments, organizations, and uh, left in January because I saw the crypto ecosystem was headed in a really interesting place, and frankly, a place that I didn't feel very good about. Um, and a lot of it had to do with this thing I like to call decentralization theater. So all of these people working on crypto projects make a lot of claims around decentralization, a lot of other really esoteric words that are, in fact, really poorly defined and can mean very different things to different people, and decided to spend my time on two things. Um, one, I have my own investment portfolio, so I've invested in two dozen companies now including Block Demon and a bunch of others that are really focused on making cryptocurrency more usable. So resolving some of the usability issues around key management, um, infrastructure services, um, and then also focusing really at the um, base protocol and sort of networking layer on the idea of scalability and decentralization, what that actually means. So how do we enable people to run nodes? How do we enable people to actually participate in consensus and governance? These are really interesting problems that have big implications for politics, economies, um, and just society in general. So it's fun to think about. And then I also, in my free time, um, <laughs> help run an asset management business called CoinShares. Um, we have uh, publicly traded products in Europe. We have exchange traded products that track Bitcoin and Ether, as well as private hedge funds. And I'm leading our charge into the US. So I spend a lot of time talking to institutions about why crypto is an asset class, because I don't think a lot of them believe that yet. Um, thank you, Constantine, for the intro. My name's Matt. I'm the founder of the Aeon Foundation. Um, Aeon is a public blockchain protocol. Um, been live since April of this year. Uh, we focus kind of twofold on scale at the public network layer. How do you make this, the, these networks as useful and as performant as possible? And then in parallel to that, kind of interoperability between different protocols so that applications over time can become less and less attached to single protocols. Um, Currently, there's a big focus happening around the Aeon ecosystem around kind of usability, which is what brought us to our relationship with Block Daemon around uh, tooling and infrastructure to make it more useful for application development uh, to happen on top of these systems, which we think is generally kind of a, uh, an underrated topic in the industry, not enough people talking about this. And I think, you know, to Meltem's point, a lot of discussion around the grand ideas of decentralization, but often that gets kind of we end up talking 20 years in the future and not talking about current requirements and current onboarding and current user needs. Uh, so we think there's a really good opportunity 
to kind of focus in there. We're developers that are not necessarily kind of inhaling the crypto fumes and not necessarily waking up every morning like living and breathing decentralization, just want something that works and they want something that they can rely on. Uh, and so we're spending a lot of time through the Aeon Foundation. We do a lot of grants to community uh, developers that are building these layers of tools and infrastructure to make it easier for people to interact with our protocol. Uh, and that's going to be a big focus for us kind of probably for at least the next year while our core team focuses on, on the base layers of kind of network scaling and network interoperability. So, um, yeah, happy to be here. And thank you for inviting us as well. I'm Daniela Barbosa. I'm the Vice President Worldwide Alliances at Hyperledger. Uh, we are part of the Linux Foundation. So uh, we're one of 60 plus projects at the Linux Foundation that is really focused on building open source <coughs> technologies that are sustainable, that are vendor agnostic, that allow companies, individuals, uh, government agencies, and everyone in between to build their products and services on top of these protocols that they believe will long-term be sustainable, uh, multi-vendor, um, you know, really focused on making sure that uh, the technologies that can be used can be supported by multi-vendors, whether it's Black Demon or others in the marketplace. Um, so my role there um, is as um, uh, m uh, leading the ecosystem team which manages basically our, our members. We're, we have 260 members. Uh, this is anything from you know, large uh, technology companies like Oracle and IBM, SAP, Intel, uh, to large banks, uh, so JP Morgan, uh, BBVA, uh, I can go on and on, there's 260 of them. And then also organizations, so we work with a lot of uh, uh, other open source organizations, uh, associations, uh, government entities like the Bank of England and the Boston Fed, really trying to figure out what is the best approach um, to uh, private distributed ledgers, and I'm sure we'll get into a discussion around that. Um, I have the honor and privilege on a daily basis of talking, and sometimes it seems like hundreds because I start very early in the morning and I end very late in the evening, uh, along with my team, of hundreds of people who are building uh, their businesses on top of Hyperledger. Um, and many of them um, you know, are, are new to, to the blockchain space. I was just telling Sam, was it Sam or somebody here? Uh, Conrad before, um, I still get calls pretty much on a weekly basis of you know the senior innovation person at the biggest company I could probably name right now saying, I just got off a meeting with our chief executive you know, at our board and they said, what are we doing in blockchain? I mean, those conversations are still happening at that <coughs> big, at uh, that top level big company. So it's a great mm -hmm. opportunity um, for the Linux Foundation, obviously, to uh, the 16 plus years of running open source consortiums um, and applying that into the blockchain space. Um, and over the last three years, we've certainly seen a lot of momentum. Um, and more importantly, code actually getting delivered, going into production, and having production-based implementations. Mm. I'm Sam. <laughs> 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 I um no I guess uh, to rough off of what you started I, yeah. I mean I was I was at Facebook for a while uh, I was VP of product there actually was running the identity and privacy teams mm. um, so there was a lot of interesting <laughs> conversations for years uh, about a bunch of this stuff actually more more conversation early at, uh, about crypto at Facebook going back to 2012 than you might think mm. um, the uh, I was originally introduced to the crypto space by a bunch of um, Facebook evangelists internally who were very excited about it. Um, people who went on to do some pretty interesting crypto projects of their own. And then Barry, of course, um, who I think introduced a lot of people to crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, got excited about, you know, Bitcoin and a lot of the ideas behind it. Um, and did, did some early investing kind of in that era. Um, and then, you know, like everyone else, I went dormant because I kind of really believed that great ideas are great ideas, but you need something to make the rubber meet the road. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, over the last 18 months to two years, I've gotten, along with a lot of people, excited that maybe there's another rev coming here. Um, it might be this one. It might take f a few more to get to where <laughs> it needs to go. But, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm one, of the, one of the things I do is I'm a general partner at a firm called Slow Ventures. Um, we are a generalist fund, um, so we do early stage investing across seed and, and A stage investing. But I happen to focus a pretty big chunk of my time on crypto investing um, for the fund. So um, we're mostly focused on protocols, um, things like space messengia, new forms of work, new forms of scalability, um, privacy, and kind of how that's going to play out. But we're pretty focused on the protocol level, not really that interested in dApps and things like that um, mm -hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons maybe we can get into. Um, 
And I mean, honestly, one of the things that I loved about Block Damon, and I'm a personal in investor in it, is I was like, this is literally the most ironic company I've heard of in a long time, <laughs> right? And it's like, it's like you don't sometimes get things this ironic, right? Yeah. Where it's like we, we're all about decentralization and distribution, and the way we're going to do it is by by running nodes for you, <laughs> right? That's right. Um, <laughs> um, that's like a very tantalizing thing to get involved with. So I think it's um, it's been really cool to watch how it's been playing out because I do think that as with most great stories, there's like a yin and yang component to mm. most of these things, right? Like it's um, you know, it's very clear that one of the major narratives in the coming years, which I call like the China narrative, right? You have to it, say China. 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 Uh, <laughs> but it's the centralization narrative. I mean, the reality is centralization is good. It's efficient. It does a lot of great things for the world. I, you know, my kind of meta argument about where the world is going is that the Chinese are clearly going to build a centralized internet that's going to be super safe. They're going to monitor everything. Mm -hmm. They're going to use AI in amazing ways. It's going to, it actually is trading a lot of freedom for, for, and privacy away in return for security. That's a wonderful part. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a really viable future. You can read science fiction. It's all over the place. But it has some pretty big downsides. Um, <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, the, the flip side narrative, and I think the U.S. and the West has to figure this out, and this is part of the reason why I think crypto is important, is I would argue the Internet was never finished, mm. right? We built a secure, distributed way to communicate, to speak uh, in an encrypted way to each other, but we, we, we never finished the project, which is if you, to communicate fully, you need identity you need, uh, and you need memory. Um, mm. And so to me, what I see in crypto and the community and what's going is a potential um, mm. to kind of counterweight decentralized security story of the future. Mm. Um, it's going to have all sorts of downsides. It's going to create a lot of other problems. But I think if you take a 100-year scale viewpoint, um, mm. I really hope we get this right. No, it's a really good point. I think one of the fun things, uh, yeah, you also run a Bitcoin note in your basement. Um, so yeah, and so that's uh, uh, one of the things uh, where <laughs> that are um, interesting in that context. And, and, and let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, that particular challenge, which is um, the, the, the problem of decentralization creates a lot of problems of practicality. And so one of the reasons we exist, you're absolutely right, is because decentralization meant that um, things were getting so complicated. Bitcoin is a great example. There's no CEO of Bitcoin, obviously. There's no Mr. Bitcoin. And so if you, uh, before we came along to actually deploy a Bitcoin node, there's actually no tool that does that very easily. You can buy stuff, like you can read some things, nothing overly complicated, but there's just nothing, you know, it's just because it's decentralized, you know, like people run their own node somewhere, you know, and they figure it out. And so there's all these infrastructure problems because there isn't actually a centralized sort of driver to them. And a lot of the projects in the space, and I'd be curious to hear how Hyperledger fares there is, um, the consortia and, 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 and sort of open sourcey projects we've been involved in were technically the slowest because, you know, they're consensus driven, which means, you know, a little bit like Bitcoin, you know, they tend to be slow and uh, uh, they need, uh, you know, a lot of times and actually to uh, actually get to an agreement. And in code, that can be very challenging. Um, and also specifically the developer environments and the, the, um, the interoperability between different scripting languages uh, really, really suffers. And so I want to talk a little bit about decentralization just so we actually define it. And so I'm going to um, describe it the way we think about it uh, on Blockdaemon, which is um, we, we, we're a layer one decentralization provider. So there's, uh, decentralization is sort of like a ideological absolute, right? Nothing is really decentralized, you know, like the, like we can, you know, an asteroid can hit the earth and we're all dead and that's a single point of failure, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> that's a phenomenal way of framing. Yeah, it's a big single point of failure, but the. <laughs> Humanity um, is centralized. That's right. And well, but the, the, and so there's different degrees of decentralization and, and as you actually said, so the, not everything needs to be decentralized and there's different degrees of useful decentralization. Um, and then, but then in turn, you can say, what's the point of blockchains? Because very quickly with blockchains, you get to a point where peer-to-peer -peer databases, distributed ledgers can run on non-blockchain infrastructure, um, it, you know, become questionable. And so um, decentralization for us uh, has three layers. We are layer one, hardware and nodes. Layer two is on the protocol level. And then layer three theoretically would be either on the app, app level or uh, maybe on a, on a sort of open source sort of kind of level. One of the things we think a lot about is uh, how do we decentralize Docker containers? Like the software tool we use to now run blockchains, you know, like kind of, so there's all these different degrees on it and uh, there's always a failure point somewhere. And so I'm kind of curious, 
uh, for Hyperledger, how, how do you guys get consensus within your organization? Within the projects themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, even you as a, mm -hmm. uh, you have, uh, um, you know, you have, you have a core group of people who make decisions, they get voted in, mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a bunch of different committees that uh, work around, and, and uh, how, how do you develop efficient uh, solutions uh, quickly? Yeah, so, you know, from the start, and I started with uh, Hyperledger a little bit over a year ago, um, I would panic, and I would say, oh my goodness, somebody's got to get involved and talk to these developers and make them do something or not do something, and <coughs> Brian, <laughs> would be the, the, uh, the, the omen and be mm. like, it will work itself out. Mm. Um, and one of the things I've learned over the last year and a half within our community is that um, many of these developers, and including the new developers, have this approach to building code um, that is um, like wholeheartedly as a team. So, and I say this all, I, I describe it as kind of a, an opera Sometimes, you know, operas are beautiful, sometimes there's fights, and then they fall in love, and then they break up again, and then there's lots of fires and things, and, but they're actually building. At the end, mm. they built this beautiful opera the working protocol. Um, so I see, you know, I, as an outsider from someone who wasn't doing open source before I came to the Linux Foundation and Hyperledger, um, I see a lot of behaviors. Can you explain the oh. IBM Hyperledger? Sort of relationship. Sure. So, so yeah. So um, so uh, we have 260 members of the Hyperledger uh, Foundation. Uh, there are um, in the original three years ago, there was 23 companies that got together uh, to form Hyperledger. Um, this included IBM that contributed uh, Fabric, which was the first framework. Today we have 10 different projects, uh, five frameworks and five tools that sit on, to on top of those frameworks and have different purposes. Actually, we, 11, a new one just got approved last week. Um, and uh, so IBM, along with Digital Asset, uh, contributed uh, Fabric to Hyperledger, and shortly after, Intel contributed Sawtooth, which was the second project. Um, today, you know, IBM certainly has the biggest uh, mega home, megaphone and marketing budget to talk about blockchain. I mean, who, who in this room or who anywhere could have paid to uh, put a blockchain uh, ad on, on the Super Bowl hmm. last year, right? And that Coinbase. <laughs> Coinbase. Yeah. Is, is that the year. infamous tomato that was tracked around the <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, but they did a lot for blockchain for the common yeah. person and for sure. the common business. I mean, the bottom line is that they are, um, they are one of, uh, they're a premier member. So the way that, that our project works is there are uh, 21 premier members. Uh, these uh, premier members get a vote on the governing board. And then there's two members that get voted up to the premier uh, governing board um, from the general membership. Uh, we keep business, marketing, branding, everything completely separate from the technical. Uh, if you, if you uh, come to Hyperledger, anything that you do from a technical perspective is open and transparently done. So we have a technical steering committee. There's 11 people that get voted in uh, on a yearly basis. They have to contribute to the project and be involved. So this is basically, you know, they, they prove themselves to be uh, mm -hmm. members of the TSC. Um, as part of that TSC, then the project teams run themselves basically through the maintainers, the main maintainers, is and there the any, contributors. Yeah, no, and, and, that's, mm -hmm. and that's been super mm -hmm. efficient. I think a lot of consortia sort of kind of replicated that type mm -hmm. of model. Um, the, the thing that I always find interesting the IP question somehow, mm -hmm. you know, so some of the stuff specifically on the IBM side, mm -hmm. talk about decentralization. One of the things that uh, we heard a lot is, um, you know, trade finance is a great use case for, mm -hmm. for uh, blockchains. Anything that's kind of not overly technical, right? Trade finance, letter of credits and stuff like that, where it's like, you know, kind of few participants. Um, and I think they built the WeTrade platform mm -hmm. um, using Fabric and, and Hyperledger. And then you hear these sort of inklings where it's like, well, but that's really kind of proprietary solution to them. So if I participate, my ideas and all this stuff, they end up owning that sort of framework. Mm -hmm. But can I talk about a bigger mm. problem that's presented by consortia protocols and just the mm. space in general? It's how governance works, right? Like in our world, the relationship between money and power has always been correlated, right? Mm power is money and money is power. The thing that got me excited about cryptocurrency is for the first time we were introducing a choice via Bitcoin um, to use money that wasn't tied to a nation state mm. or 
a set of ideological beliefs or political beliefs, although arguably now Bitcoin has become its own social, political, technical sort of system, and these other protocols have as well. But I think the question we're exploring now with new protocols like Chia and Space Mesh, <laughs> so we have a lot in common, <laughs> um, is this question around who gets to participate in governance. And in a lot of cases, um, like challenges with proof of stake protocols is people who own tokens get to participate in governance. I run a delegation service on Tezos. Tezos is trying to create this concept of a liquid democracy, um, but people who run delegation services get to vote. They build proxy voting pools effectively for people who hold tokens, and you have to have a certain amount to participate. So there are all these really technical challenges around how governance works. A lot of this stuff isn't live and in the wild yet. So I think it'd be interesting to hear from everyone on the panel, like, what role does software, hardware, but also design mm. and implementation of the protocol, the actual network, which is the physical implementation of the protocol, and the applications, what role do these things all play in how decentralized something can actually be? Mm. Yeah. And Matt, I think that'll be interesting. Yeah. Also, if you could describe like one of the interoperability in general is, is I think right now the way we experience it is, is sort of kind of token exchanges, right? So token swaps yeah. is sort of kind of the current degree of uh, interoperability, right? Yeah, and unfortunately, so, but yeah. Um, so, so terrible. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would, well, two things. I mean, interoperability is a, is a big can of worms. It's, there, you know, it, it's premised on the fact that you know which protocols to interoperate with because you know which protocols are relevant long term, mm. which is a big if because are, mm. you know, you're, where everybody's making bets at this point in terms of which which ones of these networks are going to develop a good enough user adoption story, um, you know, a good enough differentiation to say that there's a good reason to build your business here, to migrate off of Ethereum, to you know, whatever, offer something novel to the market for interoperability to even be um, you know, a topic to, to discuss because then it's a matter of connecting all these systems. I think to, you know, to, to Meltem's point uh, around decentralization, how we think about it is that in some cases we look at the industry and we say we've probably taken it a little bit too far um, not because it's not a, a good aspiration, but because it leads to all these impracticalities and these inefficiencies of actually delivering on that aspiration, right? And so you, look, you, you don't have to look much farther than Bitcoin and even more recently looking into the Ethereum community to just see that ideas don't execute themselves. So you can have all these vast you know, visions of the future and you can say, here's what Ethereum 2.0 is going to look like. But at the end of the day, you look into the community and you realize there's a thousand people trying to like, take their piece of it and there's nobody coordinating what that looks like. There's nobody managing a product roadmap. There's nobody, uh, you know, setting deadlines and deliverables. And there's a benefit to that because, you know, to Brian's point of like, it all kind of works itself out, but there's a massive cost to that as well. And it's, you know, the, the inability well, to depend on these systems developing. Let's but go beyond government. I mean, the reality is decentralization is super expensive. <laughs> like there's no two ways around it, right? Like it's not like someone's going to unlock some technology and other all of a sudden like, decentralized systems are as efficient as putting everything on one central server in Mountain View. Like, that's mm. not happening. Not Mountain View anymore, wherever. But mm. the point is only that, like, the question is, what are you paying for? Mm. Like, why do you care that it's decentralized, right? Ideology. I don't, some people <laughs> say that. I don't feel that way, right, at all. That's not, America. what? No, that's not, let me, let me, hear me out, which is there's, <laughs> it's not ideology. I, for me, there, there are three reasons that I care about mm. decentralization, right? Um, and they all come back to trust, right? Which is, the question you have to ask yourself is, what can't you use the internet for right now that if you could have more trust in it, you could use the internet for, right? Um, that's like really what it breaks down to, to me, is like what's, what pieces are not currently doable in a lot mm -hmm. of ways? Um, one, which I don't call this ideology, although I think you might call it ideology, is I do think that free speech is a really important principle. You know, start for the long-term health and success of humanity. Um, we've existed for all of human history in a world where governments might try to limit speech in certain settings. But the reality is a private conversation never before in history was limitable. Technology opens that up as a possibility, right? Yeah. And I think that, honestly, people will pay more in some way, shape, or form, right? In experience, and cost, whatever, for the ability to speak freely in the future. Um, you know, I think there's another component which is store of value, which is in some ways is speech, right? It all comes down to like basically saying, I have a database and I really need people to not mess with it. Like mm. really badly, I need people to not mess with it. And it can be a mm. database full of balances. It can be a database full of claims people want to make, whatever it is. What are you willing to pay the cost for to get that, right? And that might be, you know, and it, might, it, it comes in lots of different forms. And I think one of the problems is, is that with the community is 
and I think this, ha this happens a lot in corporate America too, is like, look, the reality is most companies should not be decentralizing things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, most CEOs, not all, but most CEOs when they come and say, hey, you know, corporate innovation director, what should I be putting on the blockchain? The answer is absolutely nothing, right? Yeah. Um, but there's, in the world, but in, um, but that doesn't, but there are huge opportunities, right, mm -hmm. that can be unlocked, I believe, right, in specific scenarios where all of a sudden you, you can get the extra trust boost of decentralization as long as you're willing to pay the cost, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's the whole game we have to be but, playing at. But there's also a very personal cost. So going back to your earlier comment, um, there's a famous quote, um, those who are willing to trade uh, freedom for security deserve neither. And I certainly think that holds true. Like we're at a point in our world where we're seeing global instability on many different levels because trust is breaking down in political systems, in governments, in economies, in corporations, the tools we use every day. But I do think we're at a point right now where one of the things we haven't really addressed is um, a lot of these projects we look at are founded by people who are known individuals. And we're seeing this in the US, like people in this country are scared of the IRS. They're scared of the SEC. They're scared of governments in every country. The reason Bitcoin got so far is because Satoshi, he, she, they, anonymous. No one can go after Agreed. Satoshi. Ethereum, people can go after Ethereum. People can go after Aeon. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> and in my view, you can't really build something that disrupts existing power structures if you're a known individual. I agree with that completely. So I want to see a return to more stuff that is created through an open source kind of anonymous process where there isn't a central point that you can attack. And I'm willing to make the trade-offs. I'm willing for it to have it be slow, inefficient, or whatever it may be, for it to maintain its independence. So I, you shouldn't I have any investment you. other than Bitcoin. Then. Your portfolio must be very small. No, because there's <laughs> a difference between what I personally believe and what I think is going to be no, I mean, profitable Vitalik's for the Vitalik's been talking term. a lot about this recently, right? How he has to pull himself out of the spotlight. And I, there's a person there, there's an identifiable leader. He may not think so. The community may argue that there's a committee around him, but like for all intents and purposes, he's that point of failure. And I think he's recognized that and he's trying to pull out of the, out of, out of the spotlight. I don't think that's a negative. I think what we lack is the ability to actually get these technologies to the point where they actually are impactful to our lives where we can take back things like free speech. Because if, if you're just so caught up in like the process of getting it out there, we're just delaying the, the, our ability to do that, our ability to impact the world. Because you know, Bitcoin is a perfect example of, of the inefficiencies of building systems without leadership, the inefficiencies of building systems without like common vision, where you just have the ability for fractions to just develop over the course of... But that's permissionless innovation, yeah. right? It, if these yeah. things are permissionless... I mean, think we'd, you could all argue that Bitcoin is by far the most successful project in the space. Oh, uh, for sure. Depends on your definition but of success. I want to say uh, kind of just a quick data point to interject that I always uh, want to highlight is uh, what's fun too with decentralization right now, specifically on the cloud level, is that I always say that around 80% of the funds raised for blockchains will end up going to the big cloud providers. So one of the fun things... Or block demon. Or block demon. Just yeah. say block demon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, decentralization <laughs> is tricky in that way because Where obviously... Where do Lamborghinis fit into that? that well, I mean, so, so the, <laughs> the, the way that works is if you look at the way data is currently managed, so you have guys who run data centers and then you have Amazon who kind of, they lease these data centers and then they run uh, you know, a huge profit on, on, uh, on, on hosting services. For blockchains, what's so sexy um, uh, around that and why every cloud provider loves it is because blockchains tend to be energy, um, they consume a lot of energy at very particular points in time, which means you hit a very high bandwidth and then you actually kind of, once you're synced, you're kind of sort of slow and so people pay for that sort of high level. And so we, we, we learned that when we run our own co-location, uh, we can deploy uh, a Bitcoin node, costs us around 10 bucks a month, if you do it on Amazon, but you charge me fifteen. Yeah, well, <laughs> probably so way you too little. Me fifty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you actually paid way more. Like you came on very early. You paid like two hundred and fifty a month. What? Or something. Yeah. Um, but you got hosed. Um, you got hosed. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, you were like, oh god, I'm sorry. And so the um, he was the first stripe. Like we did a stripe implementation. He was the first guy who actually clicked through it. Um, I think you're still paying for it. I don't even know I if that ever stopped. Don't tell but, me. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, that's why you guys are so profitable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, but but I it's interesting because you, you p people are always surprised when we say that because on Amazon, you know, they make huge huge margins on uh, on that, and that's why all these cloud companies and and IBM and Microsoft are ramping up these services because that's the business of the future. Um, they can uh, monetize decentralization insanely. You know, and so uh, that's uh, uh, that's an interesting uh, thing to consider uh, because obviously, uh, and then we're at decentralization again. Um, there's uh, great decentralized projects that run on Amazon East, 
you know, which actually goes. Or all down. of their nodes are on cloud providers. That's right. Yeah, I was actually pitched, by themselves. I was actually pitched a project recently, um, like six months ago, to decentralize the internet, and the way they were going to decentralize the internet was by using the internet. Hmm. And using ISPs. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems. So next week, if anyone's in New York, I'm hosting a meetup with Gotenna, mm. where um, Gotenna is basically this tool to create uh, mesh networks between people who have their devices. And yes. they integrated with Samurai Wallet. Mm. And so you can actually push Bitcoin transactions and hopefully in the future, every cryptocurrency I've transaction. Always wanted to, you know what I've always wanted to do? Is yeah. I've always wanted to do a Bitcoin transaction over uh, shortwave radio. Just skip the entire internet, go Africa to the. There's no reason you mm. couldn't do it. Yep. You bounce it off yeah. the ionosphere, you call but it. But now a you can do that, right? You can do that with the on the GSM network, even. Yeah. In theory, you Weird. know, like so. There's interesting little bits uh, you can do. Um, I always like, um, you're not at Facebook anymore. I'm always thinking like, uh, I know a guy at Facebook who told me once that they're building these huge drones that sort of hover above Africa for Wi-Fi connections. They, cut, yeah. they, they shut yeah. that project down. Okay, they did. Done. Yeah. Um, that's like notes on drones is kind of like, you know, can you like, uh, well, but I think radio is a very interesting example, actually. The so kind of the way um, uh, the radio network actually physically worked. Well, um, there's a Bitcoin satellite that Blockstream put in space sure. last year. Yeah. It's yeah. so like you think we about thought CubeSats. About it, running right? a node on the satellite is actually easily possible. Well, launching a CubeSat is now not that expensive. It's probably under a thousand bucks. So mm -hmm. you could just have a bunch of CubeSats circling around in yeah. space. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. But uh, back to, um, um, can you um, talk a little bit about, uh, so we talked about decentralization. How, how does that work for Aeon? And then also, um, how are you handling yourself in Aeon as the founder of Aeon? I know you have a foundation, but yeah. you know, obviously you're the sort of visual person in that space. And then what are the applications that you see that actually do anything? <laughs> <laughs> There's a big, you know, I, watched, I actually watched a really, really great video today that uh, that was produced. There was a there was an event last week during uh, the Ethereum DevCon called the DAP Awards, and there was this great video produced, six minute video, kind of the state of the DAPs, mm -hmm. and it was this lemonade stand out in the middle of the desert <laughs> looking for customers, and it was like <laughs> it was this whole like fabricated. It was a great marketing video <laughs> about like what DAPs are like today, trying to like pay lemon coins to buy lemonade and all this. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, so what's really being used is a big is a big question. I don't think. The reason we shifted into a nonprofit foundation model is because we didn't want the focus to be. How much money did you raise in your? Uh, we raised about twenty-five million dollars in September of last year, uh, okay. which I mean, at the time was a small ICO uh, mm -hmm. for you know the market was going kind of crazy at that at that time. Um, we're, we we shifted away from our corporate structure. We had kind of a traditional shareholder base and uh, cap table, and we shut that down. We bought all of our shareholders out in exchange for our coins. Um, and we shifted to this nonprofit model because we didn't want to be motivated by like, where's our next dollar coming from? Where's our revenue coming from? We're now designing into the foundation what's our, our long-term financial sustainability. I mean, what most people miss when you look at an ICO is you have the proceeds side of the ICO, but you also have the percentage of your own liquidity that you maintain. Like you maintain what was the highest market cap you guys had? Uh, probably a 600 million. Mm. Stop talking about uh, no, no. But I'm curious. So, but it's important because the the uh, because it creates like one of the the point I'm gonna try and make is that one of the fun things with blockchains is the tokenization and the inbuilt incentive models. But what we've seen in blockchain also is that that sort of is an innovation killer because it splinters up these projects where yeah. everybody's just sort of trying to do their own currency and and you know become their own like sort of central bank and monetize it, right? So. Um, but so I'm curious, like it creates real pressure points, you know? It's, so it's a huge pressure point. I mm. mean, I, 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 I envy projects that have not launched a token, to be honest, not mm. because there's no model for that tokenization. I think a lot of these systems do deserve a token. They, they need an economic incentive and an economic engine. But, you know, it, n human nature is such that there's a price changing on the wall and everybody's looking at it all the time. Uh, and and it, it, it distracts the focus. It distracts mm. the fact that we're, we're on a path that's probably no less than five to 10 years of like real core engineering and core research that needs to be done. And short-term price swings don't matter to that long-term design. Uh, it changes the perception of the market around a project. You know, and there's many projects that, there's probably more projects that I would point to that are undervalued, crypto undervalued, that are doing real things versus projects that are overvalued that are complete bullshit. Oh, I mean, you no know, we question. float around yeah. the same price cap as Dentacoin. Yeah. And if you can guess, Dentacoin is a coin for dentists. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, there's no <laughs> rhyme or reason to this market. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we live in this market. So I, I do want to make it. sure we get back to Ripple, also because I know Sam invested in it early. Um, but yeah, there's, there's. I was a seed investor in Ripple proudly. I know. I, I, I'm, I'm sure. It, it, oh, of course, a great is there investment. Is Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> I sure. need to start yeah, drinking if we're going to talk about Ripple. But, um, <laughs> 
But you're absolutely right. So, so that's been a really interesting uh, sort of phenomena that a lot of the big protocols specifically, you know, where you could yeah. say, are they even blockchains, um, uh, you know, have super high valuations. And then there's a lot of projects where people actually do stuff. How do you pay yourself? Uh, myself? Yeah. I receive a salary from the Aaron Foundation. And who controls the Aaron Foundation? We have a board of directors that includes me and one of my co-founders right now. Okay. Uh, there is an active attempt. And and <laughs> <laughs> no, and, so and, and are you paid in Dentacoin. <laughs> <No. laughs> jokes aside, jokes yeah. aside. We, no, no, but I'm, I, we, and I mean it like I'm just really curious. No, and I, I mean we, we are very actively going through a process right now. We launched the Aaron Foundation in, at the end of July. Mm -hmm. um, we decided to shut down our corporate structure. We decided to get rid of our shareholder yeah. structure. We're now in the process of publishing our first financial report that Deloitte is authoring with us with the intent of being like ahead of the industry in transparency and accountability. A big piece of that is a very, very active effort to grow and diversify our board of directors mm -hmm. and to grow and diversify our technical steering committee. We have a technical steering committee of eight of our senior engineers, mm -hmm. which we intend to turn into a technical steering committee of 11 external plus internal contributors mm -hmm. to the project over the course of the next year. Uh, a lot of this is being modeled, you know, for all intents and purposes, off of the Linux Foundation, which we think, mm -hmm. in the context of, of open source mm -hmm. management, has done a very, very good job. I think where we, where we go too far down this decentralization path, where maybe Meltem and I disagree, is that I think it's important to have a well-governed human leadership structure behind these projects while they're in their infancy. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you can't aspire to shift away from that downstream. Isn't that how every great dictatorship starts? <laughs> I, just, no. I, I just, I'm, I'm not trying to be um, contradictory. I just think like it's very compelling to say these things, but if there is an actual plan to remove centralized leadership, I think, you know, we're human, we're all fallible. So if you don't design governance systems that plan to phase out. No, but the big difference between this and, and, and a dictatorship is that there is, there is free will to participate or not. I mean, nobody is locked into my ecosystem. Nobody is forced to be there. If they, if they want to be there, if they believe in where we're heading, they'll be there. If they don't want to, they'll shift their attention and they'll shift their, their work to another ecosystem. So, you know, we've created these economies now that have the interesting ability for capital to move back and forth in a way that never happened in national economies. So if you don't like the Ethereum economy, you can move to the Aeon economy, you can move to the Bitcoin economy, and there's no barriers or very few barriers. We're trying to eliminate more of those barriers. So I think, you know, the, the teams and the leadership structures behind these projects are held accountable by that very fact. If mm -hmm. nobody wants to use your protocol, your protocol is irrelevant. So you have to be taking in that feedback. I think if you go too far the other way and say, hey, let's try to design up front a perfectly decentralized governance model, you risk getting it wrong and not having a way out of it. Because by the time it's, it's put onto the, onto the chain, by the time it's managed by consensus, it's very difficult to then reverse engineer those out of a poorly designed consensus mechanism or poorly designed I, governance so mechanism. This is actually, I think, a really interesting thing you bring up because I think one philosophy is every builder comes in and says, I want to get it right. And so I need the controls myself to tack and evolve my project to get it right. If you get an ecosystem view to it, and this is with love and respect, I don't really care whether you get it right. I yep. care whether someone gets it right, sure. right? And so the, there's a different argument which says, Actually, I really don't want all this flexibility. I want people to take their shots on goal, right? Mm -hmm. Every shot on goal, most of them are going to fail. That's completely fine. Eventually, we'll iterate ourselves through successive projects into the one that works. But that this kind of ability attack is very natural and very human because every individual obviously doesn't want to personally fail. But when you take the broader historical ecosystem perspective, I'd actually rather a series of software failures that get us to the software success. Right. Which is why having many protocols being developed in parallel is, is exactly that. Yeah, I completely Most agree. Most of these protocols are going to fail. Mm -hmm. And the very few that figure out that right combination of governance and, and technical improvements and, and community adoption are totally going to fail. Totally agree. Right? I just am saying there's an argument for more extremist you know, technology first views which say, look, humans are the weak point. They're always going to be the weak <laughs> point. They are. Like, and the more we, you know, software, the whole point is that mm -hmm. software and economics don't lie. Like the reason you need a token economy is to create incentives to, for the thing to exist and be copied all over the place. But someone has right. to design those, those, the, those bits and pieces of logic and economics. Sure, totally. But, but I think software and everything else is math, right? Like one plus one always equals two. I think some of the wishful thinking of crypto is one plus one equals moon. 
And I think that's where we <laughs> get into some challenges. Um, Consensus just bought planetary resources. They're well, planetary now. resources also a distressed <laughs> company. It was an asset sale of whatever remaining assets had not been auctioned off yet. So I, I love the idea of ICOing the moon, though. That's, that's great. Can I so ask a question also? So yeah. For so I was just in, in the business world, uh, for hmm. business consortiums, these are companies and individuals that are coming together to build a consortium. Can I, uh, with just uh, to clarify for the audience. So your the protocol Hyperledger actually doesn't mm -hmm. have a token, right? Correct. So so um, it's a permission network, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be permissionless. I mean, Hyperledger Indy mm -hmm. is a permissionless public. Right. You know, can you be you started deployed. your own interoperability play uh, mm -hmm. with Ethereum, I think. Yeah. Well, Hyperledger Quilt uh, yeah. is, is one of the projects that is addressing the interledger protocol. Uh, primarily for payments, focused on payments. It's the Java-based interledger protocol. Uh, there are people in our community that are looking at what interoperability means between uh, different platforms. Like Accenture. Uh, Accenture just, Accenture just, just right? recently uh, announced to add uh, Cybos, uh mm -hmm. that they, you know, their interoperability plan is there is a centralized point of their interoperability plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is that the marketplace is, you know, the enterprise marketplace is going to demand choices as to what platforms they run their networks on. Do you think there's, in a, like, just because I debate that mm -hmm. a lot, is there, does it make sense to have a private permission based network that's closed? Yes. Were we you expecting a different answer? Because well, you, you're, look, <laughs> as, you, you're looking for different things. You're looking for business efficiency. Sure. You're yeah. looking for the ability to, you know, for, bus for people already in your network that you trust already, but to have transparency across maybe, you know, we all, I trust Sam. Maybe not, um, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> Meltem and I don't trust each other. But we're mm. in the network together, and how do you make sure that mm. in that network, for those business purposes, it's a different, it's a different, you know, uh, yeah, approach. Basically, you're it's looking for, uh, you're looking. Well, so so that's exactly so. So the point is like that's the question between intranet and internet, mm -hmm. right? Like so that's sort of the, the. I the think the debate well, the is like. Oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, the, the question is, the whole technology stack is basically useful for this gray zone of people you want to do stuff with but don't really fully trust, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reason it's valuable for businesses don't need this to run internal systems. They trust themselves, right? They only need it when they're like, man, like I really want to do this business with this other party over there, but I really don't trust them. Mm -hmm. So we're each going to keep our own copy of the records. And we're going to like sync them up in a certain way. It's, it's a more, I mean, you could easily do this with a third party, like, you know, auditor, but like, you know, it's a different pattern for but the But if same we thing. zoom out, I think there's a bigger macro pattern if you look at the way companies are evolving. I used to work in oil and gas before I was in Bitcoin. So before I was destroying the planet with Bitcoin, I was actually destroying the planet by <laughs> extracting resources. More directly. Fabulous. <laughs> more directly. Um, <laughs> more directly. Now it's a little yeah. more indirect. There's yeah. two steps instead of. This one. Um, but what I think is, is interesting here is there is this, um, like, there's an evolutionary process we're going through, but choice is really critical. There's different specificity to what people are trying to do with this stuff. And if people want to operate in a closed network, um, great. But every company right now in the world is trying to build ecosystems and marketplaces. They're trying to extend their business model beyond their immediate counterparties with whom they already have trust relationships. And they're trying to build broader networks to build new monetization models. Margins are under threat. Everyone's trying to find new customers, trying to find new ways to sell their product. And so I think this and this is evidenced by you know, the recent open source acquisitions. So Red Hat getting acquired, um, GitHub getting acquired. These are all indications. Even IBM's focus on blockchain is primarily driven by this need to extend business beyond your traditional counterparties with whom you would share a legal contract because legal contracting is expensive. So I go back to Coase's theory of the firm. The reason corporations exist is they create efficiencies in contracting where instead of negotiating every single thing you make for a company as an employee, you have a contract. And there's all these stakeholders who are bound by the shared goal to build value. And now what we're doing is we're saying, oh, what if we could evolve the corporate form where we no longer all need to have these contracts that are formalized in place, but we can have informal agreements where we're economically or um, based on the protocol or consensus, we're all motivated to collaborate. Um, towards a common goal, and that creates new types of trust lines that aren't codified through lawyers and accountants and all these other expensive, complex things. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. That's far away, but I think that's really interesting. Totally.
Mm. How does that work? Um, and so going back to, uh, I wanted to go back to, to, to the actual token I never swap. got to your last question. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And <laughs> okay. so I'm also curious, like the, the way I think about token swaps, because there's always an intermediary there somewhere as well, right? Like, so can you walk us through how, how yeah, does a token swap work and, and why do you do it? And that's where most people's minds go when they hear of interoperability. They think mm. of atomic swaps, they think of token swaps. They, yep. um, and you know, in the short term, that's probably the use case. It's a right. good place to test the technology. I mean, we went through this. We're in the midst right now of our own token swap because we launched, as many projects do, as a token on Ethereum until they launch their own protocol. So we're doing our token swap. But what we did in our token swap kind of uniquely is that we had designed a mechanism that we call a bridge that is a, you know, on a spectrum from centralized to decentralized, somewhere in the middle of mm. like a, a cluster of nodes mm. that validate these tokens being burnt on Ethereum so that a coin can be released to a wallet on Aeon. Mm. Uh, and so instead of people sending us all their money and hoping that we send it back to them in a new form, we've, we've, push, we've pushed that to a system. So we've mm. said, okay, a, a user can autonomously uh, go through this process of burning or, or proving to the system that their tokens have been destroyed. And a, as a result, they receive these coins in their, in their new Aeon mm. wallet. Um, interoperability more broadly, though, is where we see more use cases actually going to be significantly beyond asset movement because most asset transactions happen at, at the very end of a very, very complex series of events that have taken place. You know, as Meltem, like the contract, the, the criteria that need to be met along the way for a payment to be released, whether that's in the corporate sense where you're saying trade finance mm. and supply chains and a shipment left uh, Singapore and arrived in Rotterdam, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of little micro events that take place. So the blockchain becomes a state channel, a, sta or a state system to record these events having occurred, where everybody can agree that these events have occurred, and the, the only at the very last minute is a payment released. So payments and the movement of assets are a big part of it, but they're not the only thing. We look at um, using decentralized systems to record all of these events. And I think the big challenge when we look at the enterprise market is not so much that big companies will use decentralized networks in the future, is who are those big companies? Because there's there's a bigger trend beyond blockchains that shows that you know of the Fortune 500 companies in the world, most of them will not be Fortune 500 companies 20 years from now. They will have gone out of business. They will have been replaced by new entrants. They will have been replaced by new technology. So you know our hesitation, because we started off as an enterprise blockchain company in the traditional sense and going after the banks and the stock markets and, and these big manufacturers that were operating in supply chains, we said, you know, if I look 10 years out, what is my degree of confidence that that's the company that matters? versus the company that hasn't yet been built, the company that is starting to develop a new business model on a new technology for the first time. Well, same for the protocols, right? Or the, the non-company, right? Or the non-company that replaces entity. the corporate structure, right? And then, mm -hmm. you know, the simple example we always use, which is too simple because it doesn't take in the nuances of decentralization, is that, you know, when banks were figuring out how to build websites, PayPal was building a new payment system. And that's kind of the stage we see ourselves at in this market as well. You're going to have every big enterprise in the world is going to want to experiment with blockchains but they're quickly going to be, be surpassed by a nimbler competitor who just thinks about their business differently and, mm. and doesn't have the constraints of a big company kind of tying them down. And it could very well be ecosystems, decentralized organizations, whatever we start to unlock as possibilities, right? Do you think, th I do think that some enterprises are really starting to think about it in unique ways, though. And I think the one thing enterprises have that protocols and the stuff in the crypto bubble doesn't is users. And software is all about distribution, who you can yeah. reach. And I actually think Facebook, like if fa Facebook has a ton of users, how many, like 1.5 billion, so it's a know. massive percent of the world's population like uses like this application. Mm. Um, you look at WhatsApp, which is part of the Facebook ecosystem. You look at um, Alibaba and the Alipay ecosystem. You look at WeChat. Um, sorry, I already said WeChat, that's nonsensical. But you look at all these apps that have billions of users, hundreds of millions of users, what enterprises have is they have distribution channels. And so I think it's actually going to be a really interesting evolution to watch public-private partnerships, um, foundation, for-profit entity mm -hmm. partnership. Um, and I think that's really where the rubber is going to hit the road because corporations are under pressure. Mm -hmm. I think with this new administration, everything that's happened with <laughs> privacy and personal rights and civil liberties here in the US, you could very well see a new wave of antitrust regulation come in that breaks up some of these quote unquote monopolies in certain markets. Um, and that creates interesting opportunities for this stuff to start to creep in I to the corporate structure. The, the like, you know, significantly more macro, I think the problem we're seeing, and the, we're using this slogan a lot, we, we call it broken by design. And, it, and it's broken by design, meaning that it's difficult for an incumbent to fix what is architecturally embedded in their, in their structure, right? Where, so you hear la last week or two weeks ago, there was a really great TechCrunch article 
about uh, you know Facebook and Google and Apple were, were presenting to the European Parliament about um, you know <coughs> data privacy and, and data ethics and digital ethics and all of these things. And, and the article was essentially a warning call to say let's not let digital ethics be defined by the companies that caused the problem. And, and it's not that they're malicious, it's not that they're evil, it's not that they went out intentionally trying to ruin the world and steal your data, it's just now it's so embedded in their architectures and in their designs that they cannot be the solution to their own problem. Mm. And, you know, that might, and, and that's where we see you know, new systems replacing old incumbents probably being the more likely outcome. I think it's really encouraging to see that Facebook is putting a lot of time and effort and big reshuffling of executives towards a blockchain project. There's probably going to be some really exciting stuff that comes out in the, in the medium term. Long term, though, their business model doesn't fit in this new economy that we're talking about. And I, you know, Facebook's always used this kind of like the evil example, and I don't think that's intentional because I don't think they got there on purpose. Um, but broken des by design just means that it's probably going to be a new entrant that just envisions this a different way and builds it a different way from scratch. Mm. And there's a lot to be said about it, but I want to give Sam an opportunity to... Oh, I mean, we could have... He's not, he doesn't have to be the defender of Facebook. I'm, no, I mean, I, but I it's act interesting. I'm actually, <laughs> yeah. I'm actually <laughs> more than happy to defend Facebook at length on this stuff, but I, I, that's a whole other panel that we could do for hours. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, um, I think the, the, the reality is, right, I think when you think about this stuff and going forward, is there, there, when we talk about what's interesting, look, I think Steam is interesting, right? Um, there's yeah. real users there. It's a really interesting system. Is it something that purists believers in you know decentralized blockchains like not really right like there's a bunch of issues with it it's like not a purist you know people love to hate on ripple right understandably right i understand coming from a purist perspective why that's a reasonable thing but like it's a reasonable shot on goal like to yeah. me i think we just have to think about i really think you got to start with what are we actually trying to provide to the world as use cases rather than platforms like what's the goal like is the goal to have immutable memory you know is the goal to have you know, privacy, like mathematical privacy mm -hmm. is the goal to have like identity that you can control and own and like there's no one who can take it off. I mean, like what are the goals specifically and like who's going to value them and like what are you going to use them for? Um, and I think that there are many examples, but look, it's not, a, it's not an original criticism. Everyone has this criticism, I think, of, of crypto and, and the blockchain, but it's like it kind of feels like the early internet for some of us who are old enough to like remember it, right? Where you start out with a bunch of effectively anarchists mm. running around who see like this new technology as like this thing that's going to solve all the world's problems and like mm. be this like magical future. And it's not. It's going to cause a ton of problems, right? Like it's going to create a whole bunch of mess of its own, right? And um, it's in the process of doing that. Like, you know, all the technology, all the superpowers it can give us, right, mm. are... I'm sure going to end up leading to incredibly bad outcomes for society, right? Like it's this. Yin well, and look yin. at the petro, right? <laughs> what do you Venezuela think, like, then, is well, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can like. Well, actually, that's a. But that's a good point. You know, like, and, and one of the things we wanted to play is uh, a Jeopardy. I was. I, I had this whole thing with uh, Karl Marx uh, because I was actually. Uh, you know, when you read the Das Kapital. Great uh, book. Yeah, you know, like the well, what's interesting is you can kind of say like the the blockchains actually are actually enablers of systems like that. You know, like so there's actually something to be said. Well, there's nothing what, inherently uh, good about a blockchain because you can breathe into it whatever mm -hmm. rules you want to breathe into. Just it. Those rules can, can be completely mm -hmm. authoritative and you know mm -hmm. self-serving. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so right. there's nothing magical. I mean, you can go a step it. further, right? Like I can say not only I would say that their technology does have a spin and a direction to it, and like fundamentally. You know, if you went back to right after World War II, it said, hey, we're going to give everyone a private key and a public key, right? And that public key, you can say whatever you want about it. And it's immutable, right? It's like if I, if you, if I took your Facebook ID and I replace it with a public key, and I can say whatever I want, and you can never take it down, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the world will explode, right? Like, <laughs> all of our current rules against types of speech, kitty porn, you name it, out the window, Right, and so I just think it's like really important to look at these as fundamental new superpowers. Like we are building fundamental. Should we do it? Absolutely, we should do it. Is it going to create huge opportunities? Absolutely, it's going to create huge opportunities. Is it going to create a whole bunch of mess too? You better believe it, right? And like I think we just have to accept the fact that like it's neither good nor bad, and like this like it's going to solve all our problems. Utopian view of it is like pretty far from reality. So let's um, before we uh, you know we gotta um, uh, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, but so uh, one of the things we wanted to do is make sure we give you uh, and everyone who's listening uh, some sort of uh, tools and some information around, you know, where to go uh, and do this stuff. 
uh, from my perspective, it's easy. You go to blockdemon.com. <laughs> uh, you can deploy an Aeon node uh, yeah. and uh, swap your tokens. Um, as well as uh, you know most of the other protocols. So we always urge people. The other thing I do want to say is uh, deploy a Bitcoin node um, if you're passionate about uh, this particular ecosystem specifically. Uh, running a Bitcoin node actually supports the decentralization um, of of the whole protocol. But it has um, to be a full node. It has to be a full node, absolutely. And we apparently, also you have to pay two hundred fifty dollars a month. Right? That's right. Uh, well, you the pay. way that's actually that's your <laughs> premium so price. Yeah, yeah. And it, uh, you know the way we <laughs> normally do it, like we run full nodes and then we uh, sell shared nodes, and every ten. 10 users, we spin up a new full node. So uh, there's different ways you can go about it. You don't have to do it via us, but it's actually one of the things I tell people when they're, uh, you know, you hold, if you hold a particular currency, it's, uh, you know, it's in your interest to actually run a node on it. This is the uh, first time I've heard a Bitcoin pitch that sounded like a charitable, like, call for help. Yeah, like if it you is. believe in the I mean, cause, Bitcoin, like, I, I do, and, and, you know, I do want to say, like, personally, so, yeah, for yeah. example, one of the things we think a lot about in block daemon and, and permission networks is, how do we uh, hash uh, keys into the Bitcoin chain? Like Bitcoin by far is the most, you know, for me, like the most revolutionary uh, tool and has real decentralization to a degree, you know? And so um, I think it's a very powerful tool and, and uh, um, we always go back to it, you know? And if Bitcoin fails, then, you know, we'll, we'll have other problems uh, to contend with as a sort of crypto yeah. community specifically, you know? And so, um, Kind of a couple of maybe quick uh, words uh, of, uh, let's say Bitcoin. Where do you think Bitcoin is uh, 2020? Funny little game. You can only be wrong. Oh, look, a Bitcoin's a network that has the most value on it, meaning it gets attacked mm -hmm. the most. And mm -hmm. so from a security perspective, it's been battle tested. To me, what's innovative about Bitcoin, like we can talk about the technology. I actually don't think that's as interesting as the social philosophy underlying Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. The innovation was putting technology together with incentives to create a system that's perfectly adversarial. So you win in Bitcoin by not trusting anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a really interesting social construct, and I'm excited about that. But I'm mm -hmm. also excited about all of these other experiments. Things don't have to be decentralized. Just because I think Bitcoin's really cool for me individually, as someone who craves financial privacy and self-sovereignty and mm -hmm. the ability to transact with anyone, anywhere, without interference from a third party or government, um, doesn't mean that we can't have Hyperledger be extremely impactful, have Ripple be extremely impactful. I'm not an or person. I'm trying to be an and person. Um, so I think in 2020, uh, Bitcoin is going to continue to be used by people who are excited about the social, political, economic idea of financial freedom. Um, but there will be lots of room for other things. So there will be projects that I think are massively successful for smart contracts, new forms of organization, new forms of corporate partnerships. Um, and there will also be a lot of projects that fail because they fail to attract users and developers and meaningful reasons for existence. Hmm. So I'm excited. What's uh, next for Aeon? So uh, one of the things I want to say what I find really impressive also for the size of uh, uh, your ICOs, you have a very active developer community, um, which is interesting for us to see because, you know, Aeon, like you're not, you, you know, you, you haven't raised billions. Well, listen, um, we, we've always used as our measuring stick that Ethereum only raised $19 million. You don't mm. need $200 million right. to build uh, a to build great technology and to build great communities. Because at mm. the end of the day, you have to get people aligned to a vision, to a purpose, mm. and to a way of accomplishing that purpose. And um, so what's next for us? I mean, we're putting a lot of effort into, uh, on the organizational side, getting ourselves to a really well-governed organizational structure and a very transparent and accountable organizational structure. Uh, we're pretty confident that we will be the first to publish a fully transparent financial report this year uh, voluntarily and without a regulator forcing us to do so. Uh, and then on the on the roadmap, we, we've got a new VM releasing in December that will open up kind of the, the whole suite of JVM, Java functionality, and the Java ecosystem to Aeon developers to be able to use Java as kind of their base layer smart contract language uh, and lots of other bits and pieces that you know, may be too detailed for hmm. a quick closing summary. Funny. What's uh, the story of Hyperledger in 2020? What's well, I happen? think we're going to continue bringing projects in that allow for these things to expand they have experimentation to build developer communities mm -hmm. around them uh, to test things out, mm -hmm. uh, to fail, to win. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's all going to happen. Um, I think that overall, you know, it, it is about building developer communities that are very diverse um, and taking all our projects and making sure that diversity uh, is across those projects as well. And we're starting to see it. Uh, you know, I, when you see core competitors in the enterprise space building their blockchain as a service using a protocol, let's say Hyperledger Fabric, 
when you have the Oracles, the SAPs, the IBMs, and many others uh, competing in the marketplace for the same business deals with the same open source protocol, I think we're there. We're, mm -hmm. you know, that is success if you look at you know, the Linux kernel right, mm -hmm. and, the, and the way that the Linux kernel has developed and the fact that there's multiple companies that have built multi-billion dollar companies on top of open source software. Mm -hmm. So I think in 2020, by 2020, you'll see a lot of these stories of companies building, whether it's a new business line within their existing company or new companies coming on board, but building and competing in a commercial ecosystem using Hyperledger protocols. Sam, what's your next investment in? I think that's what my next children's book is. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Sam, uh, yeah, B is for Bitcoin. What's, what's the next? B for BTC.com. <laughs> that's what I'm here promoting. Um, <laughs> no, look, I mean, I think uh, 2020, I guess you asked about Bitcoin. I mean, look, I think Bitcoin, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist from a value perspective. Like, I think as a store of value, that's the game um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, like the other panelists, I agree that there are going to be a lot of really interesting things. And I think really, hopefully by 2020, there are some things that where people, I think it's really unlikely that in 2025, the average person is excited about the blockchain, <laughs> right? Like they're going to be excited because there's something in their lives that exists now that didn't exist before, right? And whether that is a free speech platform with true immutable memory that you can, that you can trust or identity that's more portable or some sort like uh, the next generation of interesting you know banking as software plays i mean you could name a bunch of things that could happen but like i don't know it feels this feels a lot to me like the early days were like you know if you ask most people globally not most people but there's a lot of people in the world that like actually outside the us who do equate the, they think that the internet is facebook mm. right like like literally, you, you, that's like uh, that's not meant as a joke. It's like mm. if you ask them what the internet is, they basically tell you it's Facebook because that's their consumer experience of the internet. We here like to talk about the low level, of the technology, da, da da da. But like, look, in the end of the day, like n almost no one in the world knows what the Linux kernel is, right? Mm. And like, so I think we have to be really careful, and especially with this technology, which is fundamentally worse in almost every way, <laughs> right, than centralized <laughs> services. Almost every way, mm. right? We have to be really careful about getting excited about the abstractions without any sort of actual payoff um, in the services you can provide. Great. Um, I want to open up for questions real quick. Uh, any, anyone has a burning? Burning question. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're in the midst of, so if you remember what happened during the financial crisis, and I do because um, I was planning to go have a great career on Wall Street, and then overnight all of those hopes and dreams evaporated, and I had to go into consulting instead because that's <laughs> where money was being made, implementing things like Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank that were a result of us creating all these assets that were effectively worthless, incredibly risky, like we almost destroyed the global financial system. Crypto in its own little microcosm is having a similar moment where we're experiencing like what I call the crypto crisis, where with all these ICOs, we introduce this really complex capital raising scheme that no one really understands, but we're all buying it because people were making money on it. And we were like, I want to be rich if my neighbor's making money. So look, we're in the midst of reform. Regulators are going to crack down. They're trying to protect consumers. I think consumers themselves are taking action as we're seeing with a plethora of class action lawsuits against large projects, Tezos, Ripple. I think there are a number in the works that are going to be coming. So we're in the midst of a crisis. And what happens after a crisis is we either implement our own new rules. So the project around transparency, I've been doing disclosure in the space for a long time from the investor perspective, which is really important, but not done at all, which is scary. Um, but look, the industry is going to introduce its own self-policing mechanisms, or the regulators are going to come in and do it. And in some cases, it'll be fairly draconian, like what we've seen in China and South Korea. In other cases, it'll be completely ineffective and further delay progress in the ecosystem, as we're seeing here in the US. Um, and I think, ultimately, I have been an advocate for a long time, as I think everyone else is, for the community getting its own shit together instead of waiting for other people to do it for us. But we have to see a bunch of this stuff fail and implode in really bad ways for us to figure out all of the edges where things can go wrong, which is sad mm. um, because people, you know, there are pensioners in Korea who have lost their life savings because of ICO exit scams. But unfortunately, um, what I always tell myself, like I learn the most when I lose a lot of money, not when I make money mm. because you learn all of your own cognitive biases, um, which isn't great, but 
unfortunately. So if you guys want to have that experience, you can give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So. Run and out. Are you an ICO an exit scam? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <dozen> <laughs> <times>. <laughs> All right. So our core re is really to build out the code. Um, we partner or we participate in um, you know roundtables, uh, different organizations, uh, the Chamber of Digital Commerce. You know, so there's a many people within our community who are working specifically with regulatory. And the goal is that those regulatory requirements, rules, regulations, then get fed back into the uh, projects, but, the code. But just like I don't know which aspect you're speaking about specifically, but the the biggest gray areas over the last couple of years have been as they apply to the cryptocurrencies, right? As they apply to the taxation and securities classifications of these cryptocurrencies, um, which, you know, for the most part is, is the ICO crypto market, right? And there is, I, I think to, to Meltem's point, regulators are unfortunately having to crack down because the industry hasn't taken it upon itself to kind of just be responsible. Um, the challenge with that is that regulators live within a local jurisdiction and have a very difficult ability to scale and get ahead of a trend. Whereas this technology is moving very quickly, it's global, it, it can very quickly move from, you know, these days island to island, um, you know, in terms of like looking for regulatory regimes. So there's no like obvious solution. So I, th I think, especially the nature of what we're building, you can imagine that the rules could be baked into the protocols. The rules could be baked into how the systems are designed uh, at s to, some, to some degree, right? Rather than waiting for the, the, the hand of government to come solve our problems. But. Uh, decentralization is a sort of means to an end. It's not, you know, it's never an end state. As I said, like there's always a degree of centralization somewhere. Um, I think Bitcoin, the, the 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 GitHub repo and stuff, is a known thing. Like there's been a debate just recently. I think actually with uh, with uh, Elizabeth Stark, we were debating if, if if even the list of people who have access to that repo is actually public or not. Um, and uh, I think uh, I don't I, I don't think it is. I think some people think it is, but we haven't seen it. You know, so. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, but it's uh, what it is, you know, like kind of it's, it's uh, I think it's going to be iterative and I think people are going to, uh, we're going to solve one thing after the other um, over time. There's a lot of, uh, it's down to the particular layers. Some of it is also on the, um, you know, on the protocol level, on the consensus, hash power. I mean, there's a ton of different things that make Bitcoin um, very attackable. Hence, run a node, be part of the solution um, and uh, uh, commit to decentralization, you know, and so um, it's uh, something we want to achieve. It's a hope, really, uh, more than uh, an actual reality. And you can drive much, much deeper into actually uh, code components, virtual machines, all that type of stuff that um, has centralized components in it, you know, like the, the sort of ideal decentralized state um, that uh, no one can shut off uh, and then, you know, like is, you know, that's probably some AI type of concept. Uh, in the future, no, I'll leave it there. Um, I, I guess to the extent I understood your question, the one of the things we're trying to do in our own model to get to a sustainable like monetization, because we're we're an open source nonprofit, um, is we're trying to use the capital that we've retained, which for the large ex a large extent of it is is Aon. Um, it to Can I ask, did you guys sell actually or your own token, or do you only hold? Um, did you only monetize by holding the Bitcoin and Ether or whatever it is? You we've, ne we've never sold any of our own tokens since, yeah. since the token launch. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's not going to be true forever because what we're doing uh, in, in the near future is we're starting to look at how do we convert the balances that we own into kind of some form of internal endowment fund. We want to get the foundation to a point where it is uh, theoretically indefinitely sustainable, meaning uh, you know your cost of operations, you know how much you could return on an annualized basis on an endowment fund, so you know the pool of capital that you need to be invested. Um, we think that we can get there within the next two to three years in terms of having a indefinitely sustainable financial model that does not require external revenue or external raises of capital. Um, at that point, where our technology is used is kind of less important to us. I mean, we have very regular conversations on our team. Uh, most recently, our, our AVM team that's working on the Aon virtual machine where a lot of their driving motivation is that they would love to see the AVM as a core component in many technologies, not only in our network. Um, that's where you start to see economies of scale developing around like tooling and developing around y uh, communities of developers that all share general base layer infrastructure uh, commonalities because then you can learn from each other and kind of take lessons from a bunch of different protocols. And you see this to a certain extent with the EVM. The EVM completely transcends Ethereum. It's a technology that is used now in multiple systems 
And I think that benefits Ethereum rather than costs Ethereum, even though their network has been forked, you know, a hundred times at this point, not necessarily the Ethereum classic type fork, but the code base gets forked all the time to launch new systems and new applications and new private chains and public chains and all that. I think that's generally a positive thing. If you're, if you're really in, uh, uh, focused on pushing the uh, maturation of your technology, the more people working on it in any type of um, you know, version, whether they're working off some branch that they're gonna go launch their own public network with, a lot of that is still core contributions that could come back to the core. So we see that as a positive. So you know, our, our attachment to the value of our network and the value of our coin only lasts so long. And then at some point, if it gets used to build a, a thousand networks, we're okay with that um, because our model will allow us to continue our research and our development. All right, thanks. So we gotta, can I add, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll pitch hmm? bringing projects into Hyperledger. Hmm. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you wanna see a successful project that is building a global developer community and has a foundation, uh, you know, uh, Hy Hyperledger Indie was contributed by the Sovereign Foundation. Uh, today, Hyperledger Indie is being used, uh, core maintainers and contributors are increasing in numbers of, of developers that we've been able to bring into that project itself. The Sovereign Foundation is doing very well with their public network and the storage that they're building out. They have a for-profit arm called Evernim, um, and many companies will be implementing and using Hyperledger Indy. Hyperledger Indy, some of the uh, digital identity functionality will th also be integrated into other Hyperledger platforms as well as other external non-Hyperledger platforms, I believe. Um, so by making a decision to bring that kind of you know, project into Hyperledger, they've seen huge amount of benefits, allowing them to run their business, allowing them to you know, run their foundation in the core principles that they want to start with without having to worry about running an open source project. Okay. So projects consider coming to Hyperledger to yep. do that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.